Because Incredible Edible and the journey is something that we've been doing as an experiment, just as an experiment of volunteers for the past six years, and we started in Tottenham. We know that a lot of other places are actually doing it, but what we're doing is looking at the proposition that said, if local food was the focal point of our lives, how would our lives look? How would we behave? What would we think about our futures, our spaces, our relationships, the potential for jobs, if local food was where we focused our attention? Now, we could start our attention anywhere you like. We could become a transition town. We could become all manner of things. But what we're trying to do in this little experiment, which has now been adopted by the RSA, and in a moment of complete madness, we've decided to roll out across the whole of Yorkshire, and when you get to the end of it, you'll see why it's complete madness, except it's not, because every single person in this room is a part of making that happen. And in Leeds, which we launched last week, and in Hull, which we're going to launch at the end of April, and in Sheffield, and beyond. And people have already talked to me tonight about potentially in Wakefield and in Bradford, and well, we'll see. But, you know, I'm up for it if you're up for it. It's a proposition about stopping waiting for someone else to give us the, the okay to make our own towns and our spaces and our schools and our health um, centres better in some way. It's a proposition that says we have so much power ourselves to build a better world, a kinder world, a more linked up, joined up world, that we've almost forgotten how to do it. So maybe the introduction is local food. And this is zillions of PowerPoints, but trust me, they're all pictures, they're all polygraphs. And I'm going to kind of rush through them subliminally, so that by the end, you'll all think it's a great idea, hopefully. So, it started in Tottenham. For those of you who don't know Tottenham, we're a town in the South Pennines. It rains a lot, floods, it snows, it does all the things that normally happen in the north of England quite often. And more importantly, local food wouldn't necessarily be the place that you would start if it was in Tottenham. We don't have a lot of market gardens. We don't have a lot of orchards all over the place. But we do have obesity. We do have unemployment. We do have underperforming schools. We've got all the issues that modern society has sort of created for us one way or the other. And we've got a very big question, which is how come the system isn't working for the people we want it to work for? How come we've got all these issues? How come all we're talking about is the economic fiscal cliff when we've got a huge environmental and social fiscal cliff which nobody is really talking about with any degree of urgency? And it's kind of like the frustration around that that brought a few of us who look a bit like that together with the fish, which will be become self evident later, six years ago to see if we could just do something that changed the way that our spaces looked and our lives were lived. So we started off with Tobin and looking in one way, and we ended up with it looking something like that. And this is alongside the canal in Tobin. And basically, what we've done is create propaganda gardens all over Tobin. What we've done is to demonstrate to people what it's possible to grow. And we're doing that not because we want to feed people from the verges and people's front gardens and little bits of corners at the end of streets. We're not stupid. We're doing it because we're trying to start a conversation. A conversation that helps people who don't know each other to start to speak to each other and share ideas and remember the past and dream about the future. And just maybe out of that comes all sorts of interesting solutions for the future. Because the one thing that we know about the future, as I've said, is there is no straight line to it. It's going to be a real challenge for our children. Our children are going to need all the help they can get to build a better world, that they can feel personal wealth within, that they can feel that they're sharing kindness through, and that they can look forward to living. So this is a really madcap idea, but do you know, it seems to work. Here's the model. It's really, really simple. And I have to say, guys, that I just made the whole thing up. Because I see no point in endless questionnaires and consultations and strategy documents because I've done local government, I've done health, I've done national advice, done all that stuff. We've got more bits of paper than you can shake a stick at. We know what the issues are. We don't, it doesn't matter what the exact temperature rise is or level of the sea or any. It doesn't matter. We need to live our lives differently. That's all we know in our bones. And this gives you a chance of being part of a solution, not a problem. So, because we made it up, I just thought, okay, Let's imagine any place that we live. It might be Tottenham, it might be a city. 
It might be a neighborhood within a city. Let's think of local food being the heart of community. By that, I mean to say what we do in our everyday lives, what we see as we pass along the street, when we go to the doctors, the shops, or whatever else we do. If local food was at the heart of that, what would those spaces look like? Learning. If local food was the heart of what our kids were being taught in the schools, whether that's the science or the art or whatever it might be, how might we be able to influence them to actually have some skill sets that will be extremely useful in a challenging future? And also, how can we remember what we know already about how to pick up and bottle and preserve or graft a tree or skin a rabbit or whatever it is that, again, are skills that we've lost, but some people might know and be willing to share with each other? And then business. If we create edible landscapes and we're learning about seasonal food and we're learning about the importance of local food, then just maybe the pound in our pocket will want to spend in support of local businesses. Just maybe we'll want to support our farmers or we'll want to create new jobs for uh, young enterpri uh, enterprises or maybe we want to push for food apprenticeships a little bit more. Work all those three plates together and you're starting to see around a sense of place resilience you're starting to see that we are more ready for a future that's challenging than when we were all doing our own thing quite separately and not really connecting. So what might it actually look like? Well, community. One of the things we did, this is a whole host of slides. My mate Mary, who I got off the train when I made this entire thing up and said, right Mary, sit down at the kitchen table, we're going to do this for the rest of our lives, I walk for it, and she said, oh, all right. What the first thing that she did was take down her front wall. This is Mary's front garden, and it is uh, on a road that's up to one of our estates in Dublin. <coughs> she took that down, she pulled up the roses, she pulled up the petunias, and she planted edibles. And over a period of time, the edibles that she planted were um, illustrated by a local sign maker, because once you really start to try and do something that is a gift to the people that are around you, other people come with their gifts. And he made that sign at the back, and it has on it the pictures of the things growing in the garden. It tells people what they are, it tells people how to put them, it tells people how to recognise them. So again, makes him feel good, he did that for free, makes Mary feel good because people are now sharing some of the fruits of our labour in that garden. But interestingly enough, it also changes people's behaviour. And I start this every single time, but I have to share this with you. So, a mother and kids walk past here every single day on their way to school. One of our primary schools is the other end of that street. They would walk past them for about two years nobody ever did anything because people are too frightened to pick. Even though it says please stop yourself in chair, they're frightened you're going to get shot or go to the police or whatever it might be. So they don't do it. But after about 18 months or two years, they do. So the mother and the kids stopped off, two little girls, and they started to pick some cabbages and I think there's some chard in there and I'm not sure what else in terms of herbs. And they left. Shortly afterwards, the kids came back, which was about tea time, obviously put the outside to the cabbage leaves and so on in the compost bin. You can't see it terribly well there, but it is there. And that's really good. They've learned about compost and I'm very pleased about that. But the really important thing was that the following morning was a bowl of soup on Mary's doorstep made from the plants and the herbs that had been picked in her garden. And those people had never met Mary before in their lives. That was their way of passing back kindness. And that is what food can do, to start to recreate in really small ways that sense of community, of being part of something bigger. Then there's the good old health centre. Well, you know, we've got a brand new health centre, six million quid, we have a multi-million pound campaign that says eat five a day, but we surround our health centres with a landscape of prickly plants, which you can't eat, which isn't very sensible. So we went to the doctors, sometimes we ask and sometimes we don't, but when it was the doctor's own health centre, we thought we ought to ask. So we did. Could we pull up your prickly plants and then can we put edibles in there? And they said yes, provided it didn't cost any money. And so we fundraised and we planted apple and pear trees, um, herbs, strawberries, raspberries and so on. So that people and families that go into that health centre every single day start to see what that fruit looks like, what those vegetables look like. Instead of just seeing them in a plastic bag in a supermarket, they are going through a nutritional edible landscape to their health centre. It's a bit of a no-brainer. And at the back of the health centre, we created an apothecary garden. And we did, you know, we just fundraised for this. You do seed swaps. And in a couple of years, you end up with this. And it's just a beautiful garden. It's somewhere where the nurses themselves can come and sit and smell the lavender or whatever else it might be. It's aesthetically very pleasing, but it's also, from a culinary point of view, really helpful. And then, because we've got a sense of humour, because there's no point in doing this if you don't have a sense of humour, we said to the police, would you mind, I don't know if you can see that, but would you mind if we built you some raised beds in front of your police station and through sweet car? And they said, provided it cost us anything, you'll see there's a pattern here. Uh, yes, you can. <laughs> so we did that. And now we've planted sweet corn and veg in front of the police station. And what is really interesting with that 
is the police know what to it, they're terribly pro about it. They are visited by police forces from all over the north of England because they think it's hilarious as well. But importantly, on the police's own statistics, the community relationships between the that Tottenham community and the police have never been better because they talk all the sweetheart. It's a not a very, you know, who's going to be aggressive over some sweetheart? And secondly, the important thing is that environmental vandalism in the middle of Tottenham has dropped. 18% the first year, 5% year on year. The police statistics, not mine. And all we've done is create propaganda gardens. And Tobberden is not your really classic, you know, there's a lot of problems in Tobberden. So if it can happen in Tobberden, it can happen elsewhere. Of course, boys in blue being competitive, the police did it, so did the fabricants. And then at the railway station, we've done beds. You know, you just walk around town and think, where can we do edible beds? Sometimes, as I say, you ask, like in this particular instance, if there's a grass verge which nobody loves, take it over. Plant it up with herbs, clean it up, plant things, put, put signs that say, let's share this, this food. It, it's just a really good way of, making, of bringing a community together. This is the railway station, we plant it up, we put herbs on the platform, people help themselves to it, it's all about food for sharing, and it's about communities and families coming together for local food. And this is one at the local job centre. They asked us would we make uh, a raised bed at the job centre so that people who perhaps got time on their hands could tend it and look after it and so on. So we started to do that. But you know, the thing about this is it's a bit of a two-way street. So when we actually do this and lug in the snow all these bits of wood and put the compost in and do all the other stuff that we're really happy to do, it is a little bit sad that the job centre then say we can't put our power drill into their electricity supply because we're not pad tested. So, you know, we've got a long way to go on this one, but we're not going to give up. Positive is the only way forward. So that's community. It's creating edible spaces all over the place that start conversations. And it attracts a lot of interest. People write stories about it, they paint it. All manner of talents are brought to bear with learning. We've got little kids, obviously, we're working from really small level, working through all the, uh, all the schools because we're joining the dots. Lots of people do this, but we're doing it and trying to do it in a way so that if any funding runs out, the schools can still have it at the heart of their curriculum. Sometimes it's in the playground, sometimes it's in disused tennis courts, and sometimes. It's in cemeteries. It just depends. Because if you need to be creative about where you're actually going to grow, and this particular school didn't have any land whatsoever but was next to a cemetery, we asked the people that look after that cemetery, could we do that? They said yes. It's great for growing vegetables. There's loads of gourds and courgettes and all manner of things grow there. But interestingly, again, the kids are no longer frightened of going in that graveyard. So again, by being inclusive, you can change the thing. And then at the high school, what we've done there, we've created a joint enterprise with the high school. Because of what the community was doing, this high school is now teaching a VTEC in agriculture when it wasn't before. So kids are coming out now with qualifications that might mean they might imagine themselves to be the market gardeners of the future. But on top of that, we won some lottery money to build an aquaponics unit because there's a lot of land at the back of the high school. And now these kids sit on the social enterprise with us, the community. They're helping us build that aquaponics unit, and it will be the first place in the country that's got a qualification for an apprentice <coughs> doing aquaponics, hydroponics, and permaculture. And it's all an experiment, and all we are are volunteers. And some of the interesting spin-offs are that this is one of the beds in front of the police station, which is now adopted by the scouts. And the scouts got really quite excited about it to the extent that they've now created an incredible edible batch so the scouts themselves can get them. You see, you just start any which way, it doesn't matter, and then people just get all excited and want to bring something to the table. And then there's the informal learning, you know, whether that's tree grafting or whether that's how to make bread. Some of the interesting spin-offs are that some ladies on the estates are now thinking about whether they can do a community bakery. Can they or not? I don't know. But the experience that they'll go through in building that confidence in doing it is what really matters at the end of the day. And then we've got business. So we've got two plates spinning. We've got edible landscapes that are creating conversations. We've got skill sets that have been learned in school and out of school. So what impact is it likely to have on the business community? Well, if local food is where it's at, and we're trying to create more local economics, it makes sense to go and talk to the farmers. So we went to talk to the farmers who thought we were completely barking mad and didn't have anything to do with us. So we thought, how could we convince our farming community that we're really serious in supporting them for local food production? So, we created a campaign that was called Every Egg Matters. You can create any campaign that you like, it doesn't make any, but hopefully it doesn't laugh. We did a stylized map of Tobin and we put on there the places that were actually exchanging eggs at the garden gate. We started with four, we're on 64. The result of that was that people are now going into cafes and shops and restaurants in the market asking for Tobin and eggs. 
result of that is people are now upping their amount of flocks for birds, and when that is successful, they're also extending to pigs and beavers and all manner of other things. We gave free blackboards to our local market because our local market needs all the help it can get. And they put on there all that's local and people are attracted to it. And uh, the figures that we've actually got are that 50% of people with blackboards have seen a significant increase in the volume of local food that they're actually selling. It's only year six and we're only volunteers. As a result of that, we've got new businesses on our market setting up in terms of pies and puddings and local cafes and God knows what. These small shoots of economic opportunity are coming through. And I just want to rush through now. These, this is some of the other places. We've got 40 other places throughout England that are doing this. Accrington and Wakefield, and there were some people here tonight who are mentoring people in Wakefield around Incredible Edible. Press, which is really interesting, on the Isle of Wight. In Northern Ireland, they've now got the contract to roll out Incredible Edible across the whole of Northern Ireland because it brings communities of culture, but also of religion together in a really non confrontational way. How fantastic. And this is part of our backup idea on going coast to coast to create edible corridors. Because food is inclusive and it cuts across age and income and culture in a way that I don't know anything else doing. And that's why the RSA is backing us and that's why we want to do it in York. A few things. Joining the dance. How can a community do both community learning, community growing, learning and business? You start off on the left, somebody gives you a bit of muddy land, you turn it into something on the right, which is the Market Garden Training Centre, which has something on the bottom left, community growing spaces, but also it's a place where the kids in the high school that are doing the beef tech and agriculture are learning to get the soil under their fingers and maybe be the market gardeners of the future. We call it an incredible farm, it's a social enterprise, and now it's taken on two apprentices and has got two paid members of staff. Vegetable tourism is a big thing in Tobedon, it's just fantastic. People come from all over the world in the middle of winter when there's nothing in the beds. From Japan and China and Korea and North America and Australia and you name it. They came to us from Christchurch after the earthquake. Because again, what do you do that's quick and positive that the community can feel positive about? Well, you can plant beds. So what could we do for vegetable tourists? You can make a green route. A simple walking route that links up all your propaganda sites through the middle of town. Put some information there about the importance of pollination, adds to it in any way you want, but importantly, it doesn't just take you past those, edible tour paths or whatever, but past shops and cafes and the markets where they're spending their money, not just in the supermarket. And this is an edible tour path <coughs> done by the canal, we never ask anybody's permission, but you know, who's going to complain when it looks better and you're not using their money? Not many. And we've got a structure that a local artist made which allows children to do the waggle dance of the bee. You can just lift up as you go along. We created something in the middle of Tomadon called Pollination Street, where, which was originally hoardings right next to the market. But again, it's a nice place. Now, as a result of that, the council have put benches next to it. And we've even got picnic tables. And we never asked them for that, but they just did it. You start this, people just join in. And we've got all these other things along the route. They're just quick and fast. 96% were nearly there, guys. A local residents interviewed it, liked food growing in public places. 67% took their own food. 50%, 57 begun to grow. This is just the stats that were done by a guy that came over from Italy because he loved what we're doing so much and said, I want to do my masters for you, and this is the kind of stuff that he's got, and we're trying to pull it together. Because we do need to evaluate it. These are the bullets that we need to fire if we're going to offer an alternative proposition about regeneration and community. So these and I'm there. Local authorities, come up, release your spare land for community growing. Enough of this waiting for allotments. Bend your budgets, bend your work programmes, help people with the skills that you've got in that council to grow, to cook, to be entrepreneurial. And wellbeing boards, if this isn't a basic model for wellbeing, I don't know what is. Local councils, we can see all this. Put it at the heart of neighbourhood plans, promote local markets, NHS, create edible landscapes. And for goodness sake, instead of just popping pills, can we have some of our NHS centres actually teaching people how to cook and grow? Believe in the power of small actions. And before I finish, I want to invite a local York resident, if I may, to talk a little bit, just five minutes, about what we can actually do from the private sector. Because I've talked a lot about the public sector. And I've talked a lot about what volunteers themselves can do, just for the power of will, to create small actions that make your place different. But actually, there's such a positive thing that we can do from whatever sector we come from. And I'd like to finish by asking Maggie Sicky, no, Maggie, Maggie, anyway, you, <laughs> <laughs> to please come up and share some of your thoughts with us.
going to trade has to be based much more on integration and inclusion and much less on separation. So that's our hope. Um, I have brought some leaflets, there are only three left, and I'm going to leave them here. We have a few still in the restaurant on the tables, which is a little bit about the project. We have brought um, our menus. For many years, we've had these little discs on our menus, which indicate what percentage of each dish is grown within 30 miles of York. So we've been on this for quite a long time, and it's been really fun to create a new sort of, I don't know, um, Keenest Bean logo or something, which talks about stuff that's come from Edible York. Um, a green route would be fantastic, and there are so many people in New York who, for years, I mean, in our industry, have been growing their own herbs. It'd be so nice for those people who've got courtyards. Both of my neighbours on either side have been growing herbs for their dishes for a lot longer than than uh, they've ever had any credit for it to link the community growing spaces with a green route, to commercial spaces, to schools projects, would just be fantastic, really cheap, really easy. You could do it, you know, on the back of the bag packet probably in less than an hour. So those are some menus just to look at how we've used um, the menu as an opportunity to communicate about local food with, with our customers, of which we have many thousands of um, it would be really great to have a sticker in your businesses that are supporting either New York or whatever one called oneself, Sustainable York or so on and so forth. Um, so I think that there's some really small, really achievable <coughs> things that we could do really quickly. And the thing that Pam didn't say, which she's often said when I've heard her speak, is she always says to me, and that's done for many, many years, um, you know, celebrate success. Um, I think, you know, just all being here today is such a success. And it's, you know, so many little things that we can do that, you know, will just pother up a lot of dust and will be really exciting for us. So if you'd like to know more about this specific project or inform me about what you're up to so that we can, you know, work with you in whatever way, then I'm here for a while.
So if it's art, great. If it's theatre, great. You know, whatever. Let's just get it going. Um, and before you go, I just want to make sure I haven't missed that thing. Um, it's about getting it off the, the starting blocks. Um, we've got earmarked a couple of potential dates, uh, either the 4th or the 12th of April. So if a call group comes out of tonight, then it would be good if we could meet on either of those days on site. Um, and um, just one thing I should say, we're doing a bit of photographing, a bit of filming, um, and a bit of box pop tonight, so, you know, what are your views, you know, speaking into the thing. If you don't want that to be, um, you know, to go onto any of the sort of web platforms that we're using or anything like that, please say so, and we do respect privacy, so don't assume that they're just jumping in there. Um, but, you know, we are keen to work with the RSA to say, look, you know, this is what you can do, it's useful chaps down the bottom. Um, you know, we're actually quite civilised more than what we do get quite a lot of stuff done, so, you know, we're quite keen to, uh, to get some good thoughts back down to London as well. Um, and, you know, as, as I see this going, um, you know, it's about starting the ideas tonight, maybe getting a project going, hopefully, but it's about the start of something, so people will come in and out of play. Uh, as the whole process goes on board, and that's fine. So if you want to be part of this and you really want to sort of make things happen in your, then tonight's the start of it. I'll be quiet now. Please help yourself to more, uh, sorry, more drink, uh, whatever. I'm not really doing the Q and A, but John, yeah, very good. Do you do need to say this though? Um, I think it's because your um, your in Trans transition gave birth to Edinburgh York a few years ago. Edinburgh York has done some incredibly good work in York and have already got mm. spaces growing. Exactly. I think it's really important that the RSA and Incredible York doesn't uh, tread on the toes of Edinburgh York no. and that they work with them yeah. and that, um, that Edinburgh York are, they're, they're, you're going to hit the ground running because they've already started exactly. this this journey. Well that's why so, I hope Edinburgh York, is anyone here from Edinburgh York tonight? Yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Great, the more the merrier. So I see Edinburgh York as being a really important part of what we're doing. So yeah, you're absolutely yeah. right. I agree, John. You didn't want people to be no, as no, if you're right. being usurped. No, really no. This is not yeah, about our so other spaces. It's not about it's projects. about bringing yeah. it all together. It's about making bringing more and more people on board. It's not hierarchical and it's not competitive. It's quite the opposite Good. of both of those things. So thank you, John. I absolutely agree. So, you know, for the next 45 minutes hour, just throw your ideas at us. Uh, I'll get the Twitter ball back here if we can get the technology going. And um, we'll just get come back in an hour and, and just tell you what we've come up with. That's great. Thank you very much.